All right, thank you, Adam. Um, I would like to start off by thanking the organizers for the invitation and for putting together this wonderful seminar series. And it's really an honor to be part of it. I learned so much from all these talks. Um, so today I would like to share with you some recent development on EFT matching techniques. Uh, this is mostly based on work done in collaboration with uh, Tim Cohen and Cao Chuan Lu at the University of Oregon. Um, both of whom actually are also featured in this um, thing CFT series, and they're really fantastic collaborators to work with. So the problem of EFT matching is fairly simple to state. Um, essentially, when we have a UV theory where there is a separation of scales, uh, the question is how do we match it onto an effective field theory that's valid below the heavy threshold? by integrating out the heavy degrees of freedom. So on, this is the question that I will discuss um, for this talk today. And on this slide, I'm showing the specific example of the application of EFT matching to the case of uh, SMEF, the standard model effective field theory. This is a very useful and widely used framework for characterizing uh, the uh, virtual effects of uh, heavy beyond standard model states on uh, observables at the energy scales that we can reach, which are below, uh, presumably below the, the masses of the heavy states. Uh, so, I mean, this picture can be easily adapted to any other EFT applications. And so needless to say, there is, uh, 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 it is uh, highly desirable to have efficient algorithms for EFT matching. And today in this talk, I will be talking about a set of ideas that goes under the name of functional matching that makes uh, EFT matching really efficient. So I'll start by telling you what functional matching is and what is the new development in this subject. Um, I'll focus on telling you about our uh, prescription, which is uh, an improvement upon uh, many previous proposals and also uh, simplifies the EFT matching calculation. So that'll be the main part of this talk. And then I'll show you how to apply this prescription to a simple example of phenomenological interest in the context of matching a standard model extension onto SMEF up to dimension six. The technical part of functional matching involves the so-called covariant derivative expansion. You might have heard this term before. However, it is uh, a relatively like standalone um, module of the entire framework. So that's why I will postpone the discussion of this part until uh, very, the very end of the talk, uh, just to have a more coherent presentation of the main prescription. And in particular, I'm gonna introduce very briefly a mathematical package that we have written called STREAM that automates the CDE calculation. So STREAM stands for Super Trace Evaluation Automated for Matching. Hopefully this is a good name for something that um, streamlines EFT matching calculations. Let's get started with a toy model, um, just to introduce the concept of EFT matching in a little bit uh, more concrete way. Uh, let's write down a UV Lagrangian that has a heavy scalar field, capital phi, a light scalar field, lowercase phi, and let's just write down one interaction operator between them. In the EFT, obviously the heavy field is gone and we have the light field. The question is uh, what uh, are the uh, interaction uh, operators in the EFT. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about two ways of doing this matching calculation. The first way is that uh, we can first figure out uh, what operators should be present in the EFT. For example, obviously with uh, this interaction, we can write down these four point amplitudes, which means that in, uh, at low energy, there must be a set of um, uh, four point uh, operators uh, involving four powers of the light field phi. And we can write down, we can enumerate all the operators as a derivative expansion and assign them um, unknown coefficients C1, C2, et cetera. And then we compute the um, four point amplitudes, the same four point amplitudes in both the UV theory uh, with known coefficients, uh, known operator coefficients, and the effective field theory with unknown operator coefficients and require that they uh, match each other. So this is what we usually refer to as matching. And in this way, we can solve 
for the unknown coefficient c1, c2, and so on. And this is the result at tree level. So this is the first approach. And uh, this is what we refer to as amplitude matching, because after all, what we're doing is um, uh, matching the uh, amplitudes calculated in both the UV theory and the EFT, and from which we can infer the matching coefficient CI. From the simple example that I just described, we can extract several key ingredients in this amplitude matching approach. Kevin, uh, excuse me, can I intervene for a second? Yeah, please. In the previous Lagrangian, there is a potential tadpole for the heavy field because you have a, a trilinear term. And then if I close a loop of, fa of a small five, you can generate a tadpole. Are you worried about that or you are just- Yeah, yeah definitely. So uh, this is really just a toy example to illustrate uh, the calculation. I'm only writing down one operator. Of course, there are many other operators you can write down. And uh, generally any operators allowed by the symmetry should be able to write down. Yeah, but what I'm worried is that this theory may be, uh, may generate a VEF for big phi, unless you- Yeah, at loop level, yeah. And um, you have to uh, define the uh, EFT around uh, the vacuum. The, okay. well, but I guess I, I want, well, I, I'm only gonna talk about one loop in this talk and at that level, uh, it might be fine just to uh, uh, do the tree level VEF. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. So as I said, we can, from the simple example, extract several key ingredients um, of this approach. And in fact, although uh, they look pretty simple uh, in the simple model, in the simple toy model, but uh, things will become very complicated if we look at less minimal cases, uh, especially theories with more fields, higher spin fields, if we wanna go to higher dimensional operators and higher loop order. So first of all, what we do is that we have to work out a basis of EFT operators. So it's not completely top down. Um, it's not really deriving the EFT from the UV theory, but we have to figure out what the EFT looks like at the beginning. And working out a complete and non-redundant basis of EFT operators uh, is a rather non-trivial task. And then we have to identify a set of amplitudes uh, that are um, sufficient to solve for the unknown matching coefficients. This is also a non-trivial step. And finally, once we go to loop order, we often have to keep track of a lot of IR details uh, because we'll encounter IR singularities. But in the end, all of these IR singularities have to cancel in the final result for the matching coefficient because this is something that only encodes the UV physics. So there is in fact a more efficient approach that is also familiar to all of us. So this is the second approach that I was referring to. All we need to do at tree level is um, solve the equation of motion for the heavy field and plug it back into the UV theory Lagrangian. In the toy model at hand, this is what the equation of motion looks like. We can easily solve it and expand the solution um, in uh, powers of the derivative. And then if we plug it back in, we recover the same result that I just showed you a few slides ago for these two operator coefficients. So this seems rather straightforward. And indeed it's completely top-down. Uh, we're really deriving the EFT from the UV theory. And in fact, what I just showed on this slide, which uh, all of us are very familiar with is uh, nothing but functional matching at tree level. So this introduces the idea of functional matching. So what, I, what do I mean precisely by functional matching? The idea is that we wanna match the generating functionals of amplitudes rather than the amplitudes themselves. <clears throat> the most familiar functional um, in quantum field theory is the path integral, where we write it as a functional of uh, uh, the sources J. So this uh, E of J functional is really the generating functional of connected correlation functions. In practice, uh, it's simpler to work with the Lagrange transform of this functional, which is uh, what defines the 1PI effective action, one particle irreducible effective action. And this is the generating functional of 1PI correlation functions. And this is the quantity that we wish to match between the UV theory and the EFT. So we know how to compute 1PI effective actions. And let's just write down the results in a very general way. At leading order, what we get is just the classical action, which is the classical Lagrangian integrated over space-time. 
And at the next leading order, we get a log super determinant uh, of the second functional derivative of the UV action with respect to the fields. We want to be a little bit more careful. In the UV theory, we really have to talk about the one LPI effective action, the one light particle irreducible effective action. But at this level, it simply amounts to plugging in the solution to the equation of motion. <coughs> in the EFT, the part we have to be careful about is that for each uh, effective operator, its coefficient generally has a tree level generated piece, a one loop generated piece, and so on. So we have to write them separately. So it's only the tree level generated operators uh, that should go into the tree level result. And at one loop level, there are two terms. Uh, one is the classical action, but with one loop generated coefficients integrated over space time. So this represents one loop generated operators used in tree graphs. And the other term is uh, <clears throat> obviously the log super determinant and inside of it, we can use just the tree level Lagrangian, tree level generated Lagrangian. So this represents the tree level generated operators used in one loop graphs. And by equating the calculations done in the UV theory and the EFT, we can write down general formulas for uh, matching. At tree level, this is just a familiar result, namely plugging in the solution to the equation of motion. At one loop level, the quantity of interest is uh, this one. It's uh, the one loop generated operator coefficients. And we see that it's just given by the difference between these log super determinants. And from now on, I'm gonna use var phi to represent the collection of heavy and light fields. <clears throat> so now the task is to compute these log functional uh, super determinants and the simplest case uh, that uh, you might start by doing this calculation um, is where uh, when you take the second derivative uh, uh, with respect to the field, you get a matrix if it's block diagonal, meaning that there is a heavy block and a light block, then uh, we'll get the heavy loop and light loop contributions to the effective action respectively from these blocks. The light loops are also present in the EFT and that's what the second term on the right hand, uh, right -hand side uh, contains. And so by taking the difference, we're subtracting off the light loop contributions and it's only the heavy field contributions that remain. So this instructs us to uh, just take the heavy field contributions to the functional super determinant. And this is where the story started uh, back in 2014 in this paper by Henning Lu Murayama where they basically revived uh, the functional matching methods. <clears throat> but of course, uh, to go beyond this minimal case is uh, not so trivial um, because generically, uh, you would expect some non-zero entries uh, in these off-diagonal elements of this uh, huge matrix. So these are what we usually refer to as mixed heavy light contributions to matching. And in fact, after uh, the uh, Henning Lumer and Emma paper in uh, uh, 2014, there were a lot of activities, especially uh, during the year 2016, um, when um, uh, many of us in, uh, uh, worked to um, uh, figure out how to include these mixed uh, heavy light contributions. And we uh, explored different approaches. And by the end of that year, it's, uh, it was already fair to say that this is a, a solved problem. To understand how to include these mixed heavy light contributions, let's take a closer look at the second term. So as I said, this represents the tree level generated operators used in one loop graphs. And so for example, for this amplitude, uh, that's uh, part of the uh, first term on the right hand side, that's uh, uh, a, an amplitude in the UV theory. Uh, what the second term does is uh, shrink the heavy propagator uh, to a point because this is what we do uh, in tree level matching. <clears throat> and the crucial statement is that these two are not equal. And because uh, uh, whether you first expand the integrand uh, in uh, one over heavy masses and then performing the integral, um, or you first perform the integral and then expand in inverse powers of the heavy masses, uh, these are not equivalent. The two operations do not commute. And in fact, it's exactly the difference between the two that goes into the one loop generated EFT Lagrangian. And that's the quantity we're interested in. So we can imagine that the difference must be uh, some set of local operators. 
And in fact, uh, this is something that is uh, familiar to many of us, uh, known as the method of regions. Uh, at one loop level, there is a relatively simple story. Um, for a loop integral, you can uh, separate uh, it into different regions. Uh, for one loop integral, uh, there is a soft region and a hard region where the loop momentum is on the order of the light particle masses and heavy particle masses, respectively. And the statement is that once you expand the integrand in each region and uh, perform the integral, and then in the end, add up the results, you will recover the full loop integral. So intuitively, in the soft region, um, there is a soft momentum running through the loop, so it cannot resolve the heavy propagators. All the heavy propagators just shrink uh, to local operators, and these are tree generated local operators, and that corresponds to this first graph on the right hand side. In the hard region, we have a hard momentum running through the entire loop, so the entire loop would shrink to a point, and that's encoded in the local operators in the EFT Lagrangian generated at one loop level. And this is represented by the second term. So from this, it's pretty clear what this uh, method of regions is really doing. And we also know that the quantity of interest to matching calculations, uh, this one on the left-hand side is simply given by uh, the hard region contribution to this log super determinant. So this is the central formula that was established uh, in these references back in 2016, and especially in this paper by uh, Javi Fuentes Martin and others, uh, where they uh, first made the very clear connection to the method of regions. So now we have the master formula. It's still at the very abstract level, but I would like to uh, emphasize that uh, what makes the functional approach really powerful is that uh, there is an elegant procedure to compute this super determinant. Uh, there are two crucial ingredients. One of them I already talked about, the method of regions, which means that we just need a hard region contribution. There's no need to keep track of any IR details. So that obviously simplifies ca the calculation. And the idea is simply that we're extracting uh, just enough information from the UV theory in order to figure out the uh, EFT Lagrangian. The second key ingredient is the technical one that I also alluded to at the beginning the covariant derivative expansion or CDE. So this is uh, the part that I will uh, talk about uh, toward the very end, but for now uh, it's, uh, it suffices to uh, remember that this is uh, just an expansion, uh, a systematic expansion where we can work with gauge covariant quantities, uh, including the covariant derivatives and the fields. So if we work with these quantities uh, in all the intermediate steps of the calculation, we will automatically end up with gauge invariant operators in the final result. And there is no momentum space Feynman rules and no uh, tricky factors or two. And also it's worth keeping in mind that this, is, uh, that this can be thought of as an extension of uh, the classic uh, coleman weinberg potential calculation to include uh, also the derivative, derivative terms in the uh, effective action. So these ingredients uh, were already established, as I mentioned, back in 2016. Um, however, um, I guess it's fair to say that the situation was not totally satisfactory. Uh, one thing is uh, that there, were, uh, there was quite some freedom on how to put these ingredients together and some ways of organizing the calculations might um, be more complicated than others. And also the CDE itself can be very tedious, especially if carried out by hand. So this is basically what motivated the three of us, Tim, Xiao Quan, and I, to um, revisit this problem last year. And we basically started by asking ourselves, um, can we, uh, given all these proposals uh, in the literature, can we further simplify the procedure to make it uh, more easily uh, used uh, by the uh, wider community? And in fact, we achieved just that um, in these uh, two papers that we published toward the end of last year. So we uh, proposed a streamlined prescription that involves some technical improvements um, compared to the previous approaches. And also uh, we have written a mathematical package called stream that automates the most tedious part of the calculation, the CDE. At the same time, we were actually quite excited to learn that we were not the only people interested in doing this. 
there was uh, also a group based in Europe, uh, Hobby Quintus Mati and, and others that did something very similar at around the same time. And I also had um, a mathematical package that automates part of the calculation. That's really nice. So that's the introduction part of the talk. Um, so now I'm moving on to uh, describe the prescription in a bit more detail. So how to do functional matching calculations concretely. So let's start by carrying out a few steps that are very general and very simple. Starting from the log super determinant, um, the first step is to rewrite it as super trace log. And then we have to ask ourselves, uh, what is the second functional derivative of the UV theory, Lagrangian? Very generically, we can expect to have an, an inverse propagator piece, uh, including the kinetic and mass terms, and an interaction piece. We'll call these k and x respectively, and these are matrices. And then we can rewrite uh, this k minus x in terms of um, well, the log k minus x uh, as a sum of two terms and expand the second term in powers of um, the interaction matrix x. So in the end, we get uh, two types of super traces that we refer to as uh, log type and power type for obvious reasons. So in the next two slides, I will uh, go a little more, bit more details into the uh, structure of the k and x matrices and then talk about these two types of super traces in turn. The k matrix, um, as I mentioned, includes the uh, kinetic and mass terms. Uh, so uh, it, we can always go to a basis where it is block diagonal and the elements uh, take the familiar forms depending on the spins of the particles. And here I'm introducing the notation where um, P mu is ID mu. This is just a convenient way to write the covariant derivatives because it's a Hermitian operator. And for the interaction part, uh, we can very generically write down a derivative expansion. We can imagine that there is a zero derivative piece that we will uh, usually call U and uh, there is a one derivative piece involving these Z matrices and there are higher derivative interactions and, <clears throat> and so on. So one technical note is that these P mu's are sometimes uh, referred to as open covariant derivatives in the sense that uh, they are um, operators, um, they are functional operators that act openly to the right, they act on everything uh, to their right. And this is to be contrasted with closed covariant derivatives, which we will always um, write within um, parentheses. For example, P mu phi in parentheses means I D mu acting just on phi. And we can also write it as a commutator between P mu and phi. So for those of you who have uh, somewhat followed the story uh, since perhaps the paper by Henning Lumurayama back in 2014, you might realize that the open covariant derivatives were actually not part of the story um, at the beginning. At the beginning, the focus was just on this uh, uh, U piece of the interaction. It was only later on that these are added uh, to the formalism. Uh, but now, uh, when, when everything is already uh, nicely set up, uh, it seems quite natural that we should include all these uh, derivative interactions in the formalism because we do expect them to be present uh, generically. So our prescription can deal with these derivative interactions in a very simple way. So now let's move on to the two types of super traces. Uh, let's first talk about the log type. Because the K matrix is block diagonal, we can write it as a sum over this uh, diagonal elements. And we can talk about the heavy fields and light fields uh, separately. For the heavy fields, um, when we expand the integrand in the soft region, we'll get a scaleless integral. And for the light fields, um, it's the opposite, the hard region vanishes because the integrals are uh, scaleless. So this means the result is very simple because we're interested in the hard region contribution. We can just throw away the light field and keep just the heavy field. This pretty much agrees with the obvious intuition that we're just uh, computing the heavy loops. So it's nice to see that this comes uh, out of this formalism very naturally. <clears throat> and in fact, we can, uh, go even further, we can obtain some universal results. 
uh, because all we need are um, super trace log of these operators uh, for bosons and fermions respectively. And we can use covariant derivative expansion that I will describe later in this talk to carry out the functional part of the super traces uh, in a general way. And uh, here I'm showing the results up to dimension six operators. There is one operator f mu nu f mu nu at dimension four. There are two operators at dimension six and their coefficients depend on uh, whether you're integrating out the boson or uh, fermion. And there are higher derivative operators, dimension eight, dimension 10, et cetera, that we can work out in a similar way if desired. There is a remaining trace that's over the field components. We can be a little bit more concrete by uh, tabulating the results for the different types of fields, real scalar, complex scalar, et cetera. And these reproduce the well-known results of integrating these heavy particles. And uh, finally, there is a, a trace that's left over that's over gauge indices. And the result uh, will depend on the gauge representations of the field that we're integrating out. So all this is nice. We have uh, a set of universal results uh, that uh, reproduce uh, what we are familiar with. So now let's move on to power type super traces. It has a, a different structure. It is a, a product sequence of one over K and X. So this has a structure of one loop graphs. So this is um, the way to represent uh, these uh, power type super traces. We can just draw propagators that represent one over k and the vertices that uh, represent x and connect, uh, connect the vertices with propagators to enumerate all such super traces to evaluate in a, a matching calculation. So perhaps the only uh, technical point is that there is a symmetry factor uh, and its origin is as follows. Uh, if we have a graph that doesn't have any symmetry, for example, if we're connecting n different fields in a loop, then there will be n uh, terms in this sum that are identical upon cyclic permutation, and that cancels against the uh, one over n factor in front. So in this case, uh, there's some, the symmetry factor is trivial, it's just r, is equal to, r is just equal to one. However, if the graph has a ZR symmetry under rotation, uh, we will find that there are only N over R identical terms in this sum that are, uh, uh, that are identical under um, cyclic permutation. So we have uh, a factor of one over, uh, one over R that's left over. So this is pretty easy to figure out. We just have to look at the graph and see what ZR symmetry it has under rotation. And also because there is only one graph topology, the enumeration of distinct graphs is really straightforward. And also if we're interested in um, working out the operators up to a certain dimension, say dimension six or dimension eight in the EFT, we only have a finite number of graphs because we want to require that the sum of the operator dimensions carried by these interaction vertices uh, is bounded by this number. So let me give you a more concrete example, because in this case, uh, there's no, there are no universal results. It depends on the specific forms of the interactions in UV theory. So here the example involves uh, two propagators, I and J, and two vertices. Let's suppose uh, the field I is the heavy scalar field and the field J is a massless scalar field, uh, just as an example. And for the interactions, let's suppose uh, both of them uh, have a non-derivative piece and the one derivative piece. And we can uh, expand this super trace into these four terms and uh, look at each of them in turn. The first step is to carry out the functional part of the super traces, just as in the log type super traces case. And this is done with CDE and the result will be uh, an expansion of operators that are built from these uh, U, U1, U2, and uh, also the Zs uh, that characterize interactions and also the covariant derivatives. And once we have these results, we can then plug in the explicit expressions for these U and Z matrices that are derived from uh, the UV theory. So this is uh, how we uh, evaluate the power type super traces. <clears throat> So yeah, that's the formalism, that's the prescription. Just to summarize, uh, 
the first step is uh, the familiar one, solve the equation of motion to obtain the tree level effect of Lagrangian. The second step, uh, which is to go to uh, one loop level and take the second functional variation to extract the K and X matrices, then enumerate the function of super traces in a simple graphical way, and then finally evaluate them. And this is done using CDE, which is now automated, and also some matrix algebra. And we can compare the flowchart of the functional matching approach following our prescription against uh, the perhaps more familiar amplitude matching approach that I talked about uh, at the beginning of this talk. And we can see several uh, advantages. Uh, so first of all, it's uh, uh, completely uh, top down. We're uh, really starting from the UV theory uh, without knowing anything about the effective field theory and we arrive at the effective field theory in the end. Uh, we don't have to determine the operator basis in advance in, as in the amplitude matching. Uh, approach. So uh, <clears throat> we don't really have to worry about missing any operators in the EFT because all of them will just come out of this calculation. And uh, secondly, there is uh, obviously no amplitude calculation within the EFT. It's entirely top down. Everything is uh, uh, calculated at the matching scale in the UV theory. And, and also, this also means that there is no keeping track of IR details. So if you just compare the flowchart, I uh, realize the simplicity um, of this functional approach. So uh, that's so much I wanna say about uh, uh, the prescription. And now let's move on to a concrete example. And let me show you how to use this prescription for um, a calculation that's of phenomenological interest. So the example I'm gonna talk about is the standard model extended by um, a heavy singlet scalar field S and it couples to the Higgs field via uh, these two operators. And also it has uh, uh, some self interactions. So this is an example that has been uh, studied in several previous works using uh, both functional matching to obtain part of the results and also uh, amplitude matching where they obtained the full results at dimension six. Uh, so we, uh, took this example because this is something that we can really make a detailed comparison with the literature and to really make sure that our functional prescription is doing what we want it to do. The first step is uh, the simplest one, the tree level matching. Uh, the heavy field equation of motion looks like this and we can solve it order by order. And once we plug in the solution, we obtain the tree level generated effective operators that involve the Higgs field. So this is pretty simple and familiar. And now let's move on to one loop level. In the second step, uh, we are going to derive the K and X matrices by taking the second functional derivative of the UV Lagrangian with respect to the field. Recall that the K matrix has this standard form depending on the spins of the particles and it's just a matter of uh, figuring out the particle content of the UV theory. And here I'm writing out the particle content as a field multiplet. <clears throat> so it will, it, it, it's, a, it's a large multiplet, meaning that the K and X matrices are large matrices. And so these include um, all the fields in the standard model plus the heavy singlet scalar field. Uh, for the Higgs field, for example, we have to include both H and H star because they both appear in the path integral. We have to integrate over both H and H star to, um, in the path integral. And a similar story holds for the fermions. Uh, we use uh, F and the charge conjugation field, Fc, as the independent uh, field variables in the path integral. And as another technical note, uh, because the standard model fermions are chiral, whereas uh, on the other hand, we find it easier to work with four component Dirac spinner fields, uh, because as you can already infer from the way we write uh, this chi matrix, it involves the gamma mu. Uh, so the trick here is that we can enlarge the field content of the standard model by introducing a set of auxiliary fields that have uh, wrong chiralities. And these are the primed components in these uh, Dirac spinners. 
And in this way, we can work with Dirac fermions and in the interaction vertices, we simply need to project out the unphysical degrees of freedom so that in the end, the operators will only involve the physical field. And um, of course, we also have to define a conjugate field that appear on the left-hand side of these matrices and they're defined in the obvious ways. So let me show you a few uh, concrete examples. Uh, let's uh, start with the simplest case, uh, the SS block of the, uh, uh, of the KNX matrices. We're taking the second functional variation of the UV theory Lagrangian and extract the piece that depends on uh, two powers of delta S, the variation or the quantum fluctuation of the S field. We can easily see that this P squared minus M squared that goes into the K matrix will arise from this uh, uh, functional variation. And in addition, we also have a few terms that involve the interactions of, uh, between the S and the Higgs and also among uh, the S fields. So these are what go into the interaction matrix X. And because there is no derivative interaction, we also write it as uh, U. <clears throat> Similarly, we can work out the entries connecting the S field and the Higgs field. And here we have to look at the uh, uh, interaction terms that involve at least one power of S and one power of H. And also note that uh, because uh, the Higgs field is represented by a two component uh, a field multiplet. Uh, we have to uh, work out the matrix structure, for example, X S H, which is equal to U S H because again, there's no derivative interaction. Uh, this is a one by two matrix and uh, X uh, H S is equal to U H S is a, uh, is a two by one matrix. But again, all this is quite straightforward. And the most, uh, a tedious example uh, that uh, uh, we came across in this calculation is uh, this one, the blocks between um, the, uh, the Higgs field and the standard model uh, W boson. And this comes out of the kinetic term, the gauged kinetic term of the Higgs field. Uh, but again, it's uh, quite straightforward, although it requires a little bit more algebra, but in the end, we can still easily extract the interaction matrices. In this case, also note that there are derivative interactions. So there is a U matrix and there is a Z matrix. And we can carry out the same procedure to obtain all the elements of the interaction matrix. And here I'm just pasting the uh, uh, equations in our appendix uh, that show uh, all these results. So it does require a little bit of work. As I mentioned, it's a little bit tedious, but everything is quite straightforward. Um, and also I want to emphasize that the rewarding part of this calculation uh, uh, is that the standard model part is actually done once and for all, because uh, uh, no matter what standard model extension you're in interested in doing EFT matching calculations for, you can recycle these results. So now moving on to the next step, um, enumerating the supertraces. Uh, recall that there are two types of supertraces, uh, log type and power type. In this case, there's no log type supertraces because the only heavy field is a gauge singlet. So we only need to enumerate the power type supertraces and we're interested in operators up to dimension six in the EFT. So recall that we just need to uh, connect the uh, entries of this interaction matrix. And here I'm showing the operator dimensions of each entry of this uh, matrix. We just have to make sure that the sum of these operator dimensions is bounded by six. So we draw graphs uh, to, for, for this enumeration process. And there are only a handful of graphs um, and we can organize them in terms of the number of propagators starting from one propagator um, so in this case, uh, there's really only one graph because uh, uh, we can only have a heavy propagator. So the expression for this graph is that we have a heavy bosonic propagator, one over P squared minus M squared, and we have a vertex insertion, USS, uh, whose expression we just saw a couple of slides ago. At the two propagator level, there are two possibilities. We can either have an SS loop or an S Higgs loop. And their expressions are again, very easy to write out. And uh, 
um, remember to include the symmetry factor one over two in this case, because uh, there were two identical propagators. And we can continue this procedure uh, and we will find uh, more and more graphs as we uh, include more and more propagators uh, at the four propagator level, also the fermion fields and the vector fields in the standard model will enter. And their expressions are also straightforward to write down. In this case, we also have the derivative interaction. So we expand the X matrices in this component. However, as we move past the four propagator graphs, uh, we find fewer graphs because we're quickly saturating the operator dimensions by including more vertices. So in this calculation, since we're interested in uh, EFT operators up to dimension six, uh, we, uh, this uh, enumeration is truncated at uh, uh, the six propagator level. So this is a pretty manageable set of graphs to compute. Uh, so the final step is to evaluate them. Uh, the first step is to uh, use CDE to evaluate the super trace for uh, generic interaction matrices. And here again, I'm showing uh, the example of the first super trace represented by that one propagator graph. Um, so the result of applying CDE is shown in this uh, equation. So here the notation is such that uh, when we write uh, a two in brackets in the superscript, it means that we assume uh, this uh, U matrix carries an operator dimension that's at least two. So that uh, gives us the information on uh, where to truncate this expansion because once we apply the CDE, we'll really obtain an infinite series of operators. So since U is dimension two in this case, and uh, we're interested in operators up to dimension six, we find that there are only two operators. One is just uh, uh, U1 itself, and the other is F mu nu F mu nu U1. In the second step, we can just plug in the expressions for the interaction matrices X, and in this case, it's just U1, uh, and perform matrix algebra. And this is how it goes for this example. Uh, the form of U1, in this case, we should set it to uh, USS because it's a, a heavy singlet scalar loop. Uh, this we just worked out a few slides ago. We just plug it in and as C is the classical equation of motion solution. We also have the formula for that. In the second term, because F mu nu inherits the gauge representation of uh, the singlet scalar field, it trivially vanishes. There's only the first term in this case. And once we uh, perform the final uh, matrix trace uh, over the uh, uh, field components, this is what we get. We get several operators involving uh, the standard model Higgs field. So one thing to note is that um, the result that comes out of this procedure is not necessarily in any well-defined or well-established non-redundant operator basis because uh, uh, the UV theory doesn't know about the FT operator basis. But if desired, we can always post-process the results into uh, our favorite operator basis. So we can similarly carry out the evaluation for all the other super traces uh, that uh, we have enumerated uh, by the graphs as you saw a few slides ago. And here uh, again are the uh, results that we uh, obtained in our paper and we found full agreement with existing results obtained using amplitude matching. So this is really reassuring. This tells us that our functional prescription does work for this uh, rather uh, non-trivial example. So in the last part of the talk, um, I'm gonna revisit the technical part of uh, the functional matching prescription, namely the covariant derivative expansion that I've postponed until this moment. Recall that the goal is to compute uh, the following two types of functional super traces, the log type and the, the power type. And also notice that the log type can be converted to power type by differentiation. So in the end, there's only uh, really one general type of super traces we need to compute. And we can write it in uh, this form, which consists of a product sequence of segments uh, that look like this. Every segment is uh, centered around a propagator, either bosonic or fermionic, which we call delta and lambda respectively. 
and there is an interaction U um, that by definition doesn't contain any open covariant derivatives. And then we can uh, insert an arbitrary number of open covariant derivatives uh, between these elements. So all the super traces that we will encounter in one loop matching calculations will take this general form. So let's look at how to compute these super traces. The first step is to address the super part of the super trace. So this is uh, the simple step. We just need to figure out the overall sign by looking at the first propagator block, with, uh, whether it's fermionic or bosonic, uh, tells us whether to have a minus or a plus sign. And next, let's move on to the uh, more complicated uh, functional part of the calculation. And uh, it's convenient to uh, formulate this calculation in the quantum mechanics language by talking about inserting a complete set of states in the Hilbert space. And in this case, we're using the plane wave states labeled by the momentum Q. And we can just uh, uh, figure out how the operators act on these plane wave states. In the end, the result is just that for each covariant derivative P mu, we have to shift it by the momentum carried by uh, the plane wave states. So starting from here, there are different ways to proceed which correspond to different ways of formulating the CDE. Uh, I'm gonna talk about two approaches. Uh, one is called uh, the simplified CDE. And the idea is to directly expand this F function in powers of P and U. Uh, this is obviously uh, very simple uh, to do. However, the drawback is that in this process, we will produce non-gauge invariant term. For example, if we have um, a P mu that appears on the rightmost of a term in this expression, uh, then we'll have explicit um, powers of the gauge field, which is not gauge invariant by itself. Um, nevertheless, all these terms that are not gauge invariant will cancel in the end in the final result as they must because we always end up with gauge invariant operators. Um, however, these are uh, present in the intermediate steps. But of course, we can as well just turn the logic the other way around and use gauge invariance as a constraint uh, to reduce the number of terms to compute. So this is a trick that was used in uh, some of the previous works. So the idea is that um, we can, there, there's a way to figure out a subset of the terms coming out of this uh, expansion uh, by keeping which uh, we can have in enough information to solve for all the operator coefficients in the EFT. Uh, but that does require some uh, human intervention. And also you might think that it's cheating a little bit. So uh, that's why uh, we decided to actually follow the second approach uh, you really refer to as the original CDE because it's due to the original works by Narika and others back in the 80s. So this is a really beautiful idea. And uh, uh, it's uh, uh, essentially we first apply a transformation to put all the covariant derivatives into uh, parentheses or into commutators, so they become closed. And uh, this transformation, we can work out how it acts on uh, P mu minus Q mu and also on U. And these are the um, elements that we will encounter in this expansion. So we see that we always get a series where all the P mu's, all the covariant derivatives will act on either F mu nu or U. And we have parentheses uh, surrounding this expression, meaning that uh, these are closed as opposed to open covariant derivatives. And it just acts on uh, F mu nu or U, but not everything to its right. So this is obviously uh, making things very simple because uh, Unlike in the simplified CDE case, we're not going to get any gauge non invariant piece even in the intermediate steps. So, this automatically guarantees gauge invariance, but of course, uh, we have to pay the price of an additional sum, meaning there are more terms uh, in uh, that we have to keep track of. And also, these derivatives are with respect to the loop momentum Q. So, there are more um, differentiation operations that need to be carried out. And the whole thing can become very tedious if done by hand. But of course, we can ask a computer to do it. It's a, a well-defined algorithm. 
And that's exactly what we did. We decided to automate the original version of the CDE. And the result is just given by a series of terms involving loop integrals of the following form uh, multiplied by gauge invariant operators built from uh, F mu nu and u and also uh, closed covariant derivatives acting on them. And these will form the uh, effective operators in the EFT. So that's the concept behind uh, this package stream, super trace evaluation automated for matching. So in the last few slides, let me show you a few uh, concrete examples of uh, how to use this package. Uh, so this is a very compact package. There is just one main function called super trace. Its first argument uh, tells the program uh, to up to which operator dimension in the EFT we want to compute. In this case, we want to compute operators up to dimension six. The second argument uh, tells, uh, tells the program the, uh, the form of uh, the super trace we want to evaluate. In this case, I'm again using the example of a one heavy bosonic propagator and one interaction matrix U. So this is the form of uh, the super trace and then we can set a few options. Uh, most importantly, u din list, uh, which tells it the uh, operator dimensions carried by these interaction matrices u. In this case, we tell it that uh, this u1 carries a dimension of uh, two, so it knows where to truncate uh, the CDE. And in this case, again, we reproduce these results. So we have uh, just uh, u1 at dimension two and f mu nu, f mu nu u1, at dimension six with the operator coefficient that I already showed you a few slides ago. A few additional examples, we can as well compute the super traces of just um, a propagator, either bosonic or fermionic. Uh, these are interesting because uh, upon integration, uh, these will reproduce uh, the log type super traces. And we see that again, we can recover uh, the operators um, in this case. And here uh, I'm showing the results up to dimension six. And of course, the program can handle more complicated super traces without a problem. And here uh, we're showing uh, an example where there were four propagators with different masses, and there are also, uh, there is also a covariant, open covariant derivative, P nu. And in also in this case, we can obtain the result very easily. <clears throat> so that brings me to the end of the talk. To summarize, uh, we have devised a prescription uh, for EFT matching up to one loop level that is fully functional. And we have also written a mathematical package called stream that automates the most tedious part, the CDE in this uh, streamline prescription. And just to recap, there were four key steps in this uh, prescription. The first step is to solve the equation of motion to obtain the tree level effective Lagrangian. The second step is to take uh, the second functional derivative uh, and extract the K and X matrices. The third step is to enumerate the functional super traces and this can be done in a simple graphical way. And the final step is to evaluate these functional super traces uh, which is done using CDE, which is now automated plus uh, matrix algebra. Obviously there are many uh, interesting applications in particle phenomenology uh, that we can think of. And in fact, there is a growing literature applying functional matching techniques to uh, phenomenology studies in recent years. And uh, also a lot of them um, contributed to the technical development of functional matching and covariant derivative expansion. Uh, so I would like to give credit to all of them. Uh, of course, there are many other questions we can ask. Uh, I have focused on relativistic EFTs in this case, uh, in this talk. Uh, how about other EFTs? Uh, in fact, a lot of the ingredients will carry over uh, quite straightforwardly to other EFTs. Uh, for example, the case of uh, heavy quark effective theory uh, has been worked out in this uh, very nice paper by my collaborators, Tim and Xiao Tran, together with uh, Margaret Francis. And of course, the list goes on. Um, how about beyond one loop? Uh, to make it uh, really a systematic and well-defined procedure, we want to 
carry out the procedure, uh, the, the, the algorithm also a through loop and beyond. And uh, for the uh, effective action, uh, there is a well-established procedure to evaluate it uh, up to higher loop order. And the question is how to extract the ingredients for uh, EFT matching calculations. So this is something that we're still uh, working on at this moment. And beyond matching, functional methods also provide a way to perform efficient RGB calculations, which can also be important in many phenomenology studies. And more broadly, perhaps uh, functional methods uh, just give us a new way of uh, looking at effective field theories and perhaps we can gain new insights on other aspects of EFTs as well. And of course, uh, we are hoping to have more exciting stuff to add to the list in the upcoming years. So with that, I'll stop here and uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm very happy to take questions from